Welcome to STEMiVers Podcast, episode 47. In this episode, Peter talks with Dr. Linda McIver. Dr. Linda McIver started out as an academic with a PhD in computer science education. When it became apparent that high school teaching was a lot more fun, Linda began a highly successful career at John Monash Science School, where she built innovative courses in computational and data science for year 10 and year 11 students. Nominated one of the inaugural superstars of STEM in 2017, Linda is passionate about creating authentic project experiences to motivate all students to become technologically and data literate. While Linda loves the classroom, it was rapidly becoming clear that teachers in the Australian school system were keen to embrace data science, but there was a serious lack of resources to support that. That's why Linda created Adsey to support data science in education. This is STEMiVerse Podcast, episode 47. STEMiVerse is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom or a parent or caretaker teaching at home, this podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to help our children prepare for life in a world of radical change and why not abundance. Well, um, Linda, thank you for being on the podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks. It's really good to be here. Great, great. Good to have you on. Uh, Whereabouts are you? I'm in Melbourne. In Melbourne. It's grey and threatening to rain. What's Melbourne like these days? (laughs) Cold. Winter has hit with a bang. Yeah, it did. Yeah, Sydney's like that as well. So um, we've had a few cold days. Uh, The fireplace is on. Well, we use gas. It's not... You know, smoky fire, try to keep our atmosphere clear. But it is, yeah, it is winter officially. Yes, it certainly is. <laughs> so um, I'm really happy to have you on our show because uh, we've never had a data scientist before. So I've got a lot of data-related questions to ask you. And uh, I also know that you are a superstar, like a superstar of science, which is uh, another privilege to be speaking to you about. So, I'd like to start a bit differently to how I normally start these interviews. So, normally I ask people to tell us a little bit about themselves and their history, but in your case, I was looking at your website and I went to your About Me page and I was reading there about yourself and you describe yourself as a professional outlier. I thought I'd <laughs> ask you about what that means. <laughs> it's quite unusual. <laughs> um. Do you know, I've never been asked that question before. No one's ever ever picked up on that before. Um, I've been an outlier from very early on. Um, I'm I'm really tall for a girl. I'm about mm. 185 centimetres tall, which, you know, you, you can't help but stand out when you're that height, um, particularly when you're female. But also, you know, I've I've always felt like whatever the demographic is, whatever the target demographic is, I'm not it. Mm. <laughs> because... I, I tend to think a little bit differently and my kids do too. And I tell them, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a disadvantage at school where sometimes you have to really fit in and, and think like everybody else in order to, to get the, what they consider the right answer. But um, as you go along, thinking differently and being an outlier and being sort of slightly on the, uh, you know, outside what people consider normal is actually a huge advantage. Hmm. You just have the opportunity then to to see solutions to problems that people just don't otherwise consider. You know, if you if you follow the the normal process all the time, then all you'll get is a normal outcome. Right, yep. But if you think differently, then you have the opportunity to make change. So how? Oh, actually, that leads me to the next question. Uh, did you always feel as an outlier? And then, I suppose, how did that lead you, like, from a child to, like, growing up and becoming a professional eventually, from being, like, an an outlier without a particular classification into a professional outlier? Yeah, I did always feel a bit different. I went to a girls' school, which, for me, wasn't a good fit because I tended to 
just relate more easily to boys and to um to be more interested in the kinds of things that that boys were interested in than mm-hmm. at least the the girls around me for the most part were interested in and so I always felt a little bit strange but my family encouraged that my cousin Chris gave me a, a Commodore 64 when I was really <laughs> little yeah. um and it never occurred to him that that was something a girl wouldn't want to play with so I was learning to to program in basic and you know, I never did anything uh, hugely technical, but I just, I learned early on that that you could actually control these things. Mm. You could tell them what to do and they, you know, you could tell them something they didn't already know how to do and they would do it. And I found that really exciting. Uh, but it didn't occur to me that that was something I wanted to do or something I oh, could do as a yeah. career. You know, it wasn't something that I saw people around me doing and particular girls I didn't see girls doing that kind of stuff at all. And at school we were encouraged into, um, we were told we could do everything or anything, but we weren't really, you know, it wasn't one of the, the highlighted careers. So I'm wondering, you've got a computer there, you've got a, a Commodore 64. In those days, those computers were not like in every house, right? Uh, it's quite no, unusual. No, no. And um, you're enjoying learning um basic and controlling the computer uh, but yeah. at, at, at that time it didn't occur to you that could be potentially a career and I wonder was it perhaps because maybe your your school being an all uh, girls school in a way even without you know planning that particular aspect of schooling uh, it was kind of pushing girls to a particular kind of career you know doctors lawyers things like that come to my mind is there any element of truth in what I said in your case? It, so it was a fairly traditional school and there was, yeah, the expectation was that we'd, we would do high prestige things probably, mm. but not, you know, nobody. I mean, computers weren't really on anybody's radar at that point. To be fair, mm. I don't know mm. that at a boys' school they would have been told they could be computer scientists because I don't think anybody really knew what a computer mm. scientist <laughs> was. But we did have a, a really great teacher who I don't think he was trained in computing as such but he he ran the computing stuff at the school and he was very supportive and you know my friends and I used to spend hours at lunchtime on these really ancient Macintoshes they weren't ancient then they were Mm. high tech (laughs) and we would play the Infocom hitchhikers game which nerds of my era will relate to but probably no one's (laughs) ever heard of these days Uh, but it was a really exciting text adventure and in a sense, it was a form of programming because you needed very precise instructions to, in order to be able to do anything. Mm. Uh, and we were very into science fiction, and so we loved that. And, and the, the teacher was really encouraging, and he kept us going with that, with that interest and, and you know, showing us things that we could do. And it wasn't until I got to uni where I needed... I went to do a science degree. I was actually interested Mm. in genetics and so it was going to be biology was the main focus and I needed one more subject in first year. And I thought, oh, well, you know, computers are fun. And that would never have happened if it hadn't been for the Commodore 64 that my cousin gave me and the encouragement of that teacher (laughs) to go, oh, well, I know computers are fun and I could do this. This was something I knew I could do. You know, I played with this and had fun. So I picked that as my fourth subject. And by third year, computer science was the only thing I was studying. Right. So there you go. So I guess uh, um, your experience with this particular technology, even though it was early days, it it did carry you over uh, the next decades into a particular career that is squarely into uh, what these computers or what these machines represented even back then. So Yeah, absolutely. And it was it was the I never had that message that I couldn't do it because I kind of bypass that hmm. through Chris giving me that that computer I knew it was something I could do so I never bought into that whole you know this is not something girls do or girls are interested in I, I was already hooked yep. and uh, the fear factor I think is the biggest thing that pushes people out of computing and not just girls but a lot of boys hmm. too hmm. and I didn't have that because I'd had this early positive experience um, yeah. frustrating <laughs> but positive and so I knew that this was something I could do and something I was interested in and, and it wasn't scary for me. Right, awesome. I, I wonder at which point it occurred to you that you could become a teacher because uh, I'm looking at uh, your profile on the Science Technology Australia website and at some point you say that you realised that, that being a teacher 
was a lot more fun. Uh, when and how did that happen? So I was um, I was an academic for a long time at Monash, and yeah. when my second child was due, they were having a round of redundancies, and I'd realised by that point that I wasn't driven enough to make a go of a research career. You have mm. to be really pretty obsessed to make research work. You have to really give it everything you've got. Yeah. But I really enjoyed the lecturing and the, the teaching part. Um, so I I took a package and I, I stayed home with my with my baby for a while and I thought that I wanted to go into teaching, but all of the teaching degrees that you could do were full-time, which is not really an option for a new mum. Mm. So I... Um, I kind of shelved that and I did a bunch of things. I was a project officer for the Breastfeeding Association. Yeah. I was a freelance writer. I did communications and training with Oxfam in a voluntary position. And then someone I used to work with at Monash called me up and he said, look, we're doing this thing that you might be interested in. And the first thing I said to him was, you know I'm not coming back, don't you? Because <laughs> I knew by then academia was not my thing. And then he told me about this new school that was opening, John Monash Science School, and I started work the next day, <laughs> having said I'm not coming back. I was working with, for Monash on developing curriculum for John Monash. And right. I, within the year, I knew that every time I, they let me into the classroom there, I just had so much fun. That when they said, you could actually teach here and do your teaching qualification at the same time, I just jumped at it. So you were developing courses in computational and data science, is that right? Yeah, it started out, I was developing, uh, helping them develop a year 10 um, computer science course and a year 11 computational science course. Mm -hmm. And that morphed over the years into data science for the year 10s. Awesome. So I'd like to talk more about your courses um, in, in a few minutes, but I've got another mm -hmm. question, um, again, in relation to something that I saw in your About Me page. And I have to say that I really like it when teachers have got websites and, you know, they talk about themselves. <laughs> it just gives <laughs> a, a, a good picture of what you're doing and where your passions are. So I was looking there in your about me page and uh, I read that you are interested in opportunities to promote social science. I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, let me have a look uh, at a few other parts of your website. I looked at some of your blog articles and one of them, which you published recently, so that's back in April 6, uh, titled How Your Choice Not to Immunize Could Kill. Do you know which uh. one I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. Yes. Okay, so that's about uh, immunization, right? So how people believe that it's their freedom of choice to choose whether they should yes. be immunized or not uh, without yep. considering that, you know, there's a lot of other people who are sensitive in the kind of uh, bacteria, viruses, etc., that are easily preventable through immunization, but these people are, have got a weakened immune system perhaps and they could, yep. they could die. So, uh, so it's a lack of understanding of herd immunity that's the yeah, problem. Yeah, so th th I guess there's a lot of data science coming through that. Uh, of course, there's biology and medicine, uh, but yeah. I think there's a lot of education that is involved as well. So I wanted to ask yeah. you, what do you mean by social justice? And uh, what kind of opportunities are you looking for to promote social justice? Yeah, so I've been interested in social justice for a long time. I became aware of the fair trade movement many years ago and actually wrote a few articles about it and went around interviewing people to find out more about it. And for me, what it comes down to is that when you're born into a position of privilege, as I was, I was born into a, a very comfortably off white family in a very prosperous nation. I believe that we all have the responsibility to lift everybody up at least to our own level of privilege mm. and there are a lot of people out there who through nothing but accident of birth mm. are not in the very comfortable and safe position that i'm in you know they're they're in war-torn countries or they're in yeah. poverty-stricken countries or they're um or here they're struggling for you know by being born into a a poor family or a poor neighborhood and just not having the same advantages that i have or you know, yeah. by virtue of race, I don't have to think about uh, my my race and my nationality, my skin colour or my sexuality because none of those things work against me. But if they work against you because you happen to be in a minority or a, or a group that somehow got a prejudice against them, then everything's so much harder. So I think because mm -hmm. I've got it relatively easy, it's my responsibility to 
to make it as easy as I can for everybody else, to lift everybody else up, give them at least the opportunities that I've had. Right. So that's what social justice is for you then? Yeah, and absolutely. Do you get the opportunity to promote social justice? Um, yeah. So I write about it a lot. I, I work in it a lot. I have a, a strong focus. It's one of the reasons I made the Australian Data Science Education Institute hmm. a registered charity rather hmm. than a, a startup intended to cash in Profit on the need for this yeah. kind of education because I want to make the resources that I put together free. I want to to really support particularly low socioeconomic status schools and, and schools that don't have the resources to to spend a lot of money on professional development and on you know resources and toys for the students. I want to make sure that they have the same opportunities as the wealthy schools and oh, the, you know the schools in right. prosperous neighborhoods and that kind of stuff. So I see. So you, you took your two passions, which is data science and social um, justice, and you built a non-profit organization, the Australian Data Science Education Institute. And that's how you promote social justice, right? Through ADSEI. Is, is that the correct pronunciation of the initials of Australian Data Science Education Institute? Uh, yeah, ADSEI or ADSEI. Yeah. Could you tell us about, about the institute, please? Okay. So the Australian Data Science Education Institute is specifically focused on supporting teachers to put data science into the way they teach everything across the curriculum from the obvious science and maths through to history and geography and even English. Hmm. Because increasingly in the real world, data is the way things are studied and the way they're done in everything from you know business to science and hmm. data is... It's a fundamental part of our lives and it's a fundamental ruling force increasingly in our lives and we don't understand how it works or um, how it's used for us or how it's used against us. So it's really important that students become, that, that kids become data literate and know um, how data is being used and, and what it can achieve and also what the risks are but also that they can use it themselves and, and use it in a valid and, and effective fashion to, to help make the world a better place. Yeah. If we are all data and science literate, then we can make incredible progress. But one of the things that holds us back is this lack of scientific literacy mm. and the lack of data literacy. So we really need to work to build that into our education system. Yeah. It's interesting how, especially the last few years, uh, with the proliferation of you know, smart devices and social networks and uh, things that actually uh, eat up a lot of data, create a lot of data and, and share it with everybody else on the planet, um, how data yep. comes to the forefront when some of that is lost or stolen usually, or you know, there's a breach of the Facebook yep. one uh, just about a month ago or That's a couple right. of months ago is a big one. Yeah. So this is something that brings data to our attention, but it's mm. actually fundamental to a lot of other things. And this mm -hmm. is why one of the reasons I wrote that post about um, vaccinations and the anti-vax movement, mm. because if we were all scientifically literate and we were all data literate, then anti-vax would not be a thing because the, mm. the data and the science on vaccinations is so clear <laughs> that <they're, laughs> the, the benefits far outweigh any risks and that if we, we vaccinate everybody we save lives and, yeah. and millions of lives. So there's just there's no scientifically valid reason for the anti-vax movement. Um, yeah. And if we were all science literate and data literate, that would not be a thing. Climate change yeah. denialism would yes, not be yes. a thing. You know, we, we'd actually, we could make progress. We'd, a lot of this stuff is holding us back because we just don't understand. Uh, you just describe a perfect world. So I was about to mention uh, so many other anti, you know, anti this and anti that, and uh, it's mm. all based on uh, misunderstanding, misconception, as opposed to miseducation. Exactly. And data exactly. Is, and people, yeah. people use that against us. So yeah. uh, sections of the media use it against us. Politicians use it against us, and they 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 sh they throw figures at us and they throw graphs at us, and and we tend to bend at the knees when we see a graph and go, "Oh, there's a graph. It must be true." But there are so yeah. many ways. That, that graphs can be accurate but wholly misleading. So one of the fundamental right. things we need to teach in data literacy is when you look at a graph, what questions do you ask? And how do you know whether that graph is valid or not? For example, there's a classic graph used in uh, that was used by the Daily Mail some years ago that showed that climate change wasn't a thing because mm. it, it showed the, the variations in temperature and it showed 
from 1997 to 2012, and it showed that the, this this was one section that started at the same place that it finished. And so they were like, see, it's not increasing. But, of course, that's a, a tiny slice of the overall graph. If yeah. you look at the full graph, it's very clearly <sighs> increasing dramatically. So, you know, the first question you go is, well, why are you only showing me 1997 to 2012, what's the rest of the data say? Yeah, and if we all yeah. knew enough to ask that kind of question, this would be a different conversation. Yeah, something that you see not just in those areas of uh, controversy, let's call it that, uh, anti-vax <laughs> and climate change and, and all that, but even scientists are very often are very selective in how they present the data. I was just looking, I won't mention any names here, and it's not important, but <laughs> I was looking at... Uh, data coming out of medical surveys and um, the data was selected in particular to promote the point of view of the author of a particular study. We're going back into the 60s now. It's not something recent. Yeah. So. Yeah. But um, uh, that was something that was picked up by a committee of people that could understand data science and statistics and how those work mm -hmm. and then ask the right questions. Um, yeah, and it happens all the time. Yeah. And a lot of the time it's not even malicious. It's yeah. just thoughtless use of data and thoughtless representation of data. Yeah. So learning to spot that, but also learning to present the data validly yourself is, is hugely important. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, Linda, most of us understand I suppose, a satisfactory level, you know, what is physics, what is mathematics, uh, what is chemistry, all those are yeah. sciences. What exactly mm -hmm. is data science? So one definition I saw of data science recently that I really liked is that it's, it's applying scientific method to solving problems using data. I think that's quite a nice summary, but if you want mm -hmm. to break it down, it's, it's the, the collection of data and, and yeah. how to do that in a valid and unbiased way. And that's a huge, <laughs> huge right. can of worms. The analysis of data, and again, so many ways you can, you can go wrong deliberately or accidentally. And then the communication of data is the really important mm -hmm. thing, and that's often through visualisation. How, how do you make those results meaningful? For example, if you think of an MRI scan, it comes back to us as a picture of the brain, but an MRI is not, does not actually, it's not a picture. It's not a photo taken of your brain. What that picture is, is a visual representation of a really complex statistical process, mm -hmm. but they've mapped it onto a picture of the brain so that we can understand it because you can see, you know, the, the areas of the brain and you can see, um, you can understand yeah. what you're looking at because it looks like a picture of the brain. It's not actually yeah. a photo of the brain. But if we represent it as that, then we have a way of understanding it. So a brain scan, uh, I'm going to translate what you said so I can understand it. <laughs> so a brain <laughs> scan is, is not taken by anything equivalent to a, a photographic camera, right? Like with a CCD right. sensor that actually captures light. So let's call that a sensor and that at the other end of that sensor, numbers come out. But those numbers mm -hmm. then are translated by software that is built using a method or I suppose programming that is based on data science, developed by data science and particular methodologies that you use in data science in order to create a representation that a doctor who is not a data scientist is able to use for the purpose of uh, identifying a, a tumor, I suppose, in the brain or other structures that are uh, that need to be looked at more closely. I, is that how it works? Yeah, that's exactly right. So in particular, in the case of a functional MRI scan, which shows you which parts of the brain are being used. Mm. So functional MRI is used to understand the structure of the brain. And we will take, take images while people, are, we'll take movies rather, while uh -huh. people are doing things. So like you might be doing a mathematical task, which areas of your brain light up when you're doing addition uh, or you might watch a sad movie and they look at which areas of the brain light up with that emotion. Again, you get a pic what looks like a picture of the brain out and little areas lighting up, but it's that representation of the mathematical process that translates the data that the sensor gets into an image that a doctor can understand mm -hmm. or, a, or a researcher can understand. Yep. And the thing that <sighs> functional MRIs are a bit of a cautionary tale because for the first 15 years when we had functional MRI scans, the software that was 
making that translation was actually flawed. Hmm. And they were getting up to 70% false positive results, meaning that for those 15 years and 40,000 studies, the results were not what we thought they were. Wow, yeah. And because they only stored the analysis rather than storing the the full data, they couldn't go back and and reanalyze it. So so those studies are useless, although almost certainly still being cited. Oh, there you go. Um, Yeah, it was quite interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so this is... This is one of those data science cautionary tales where we need more people to to know how data works so that more people are, you know, there there are more checks and balances and people are going, Mm. well, making all these decisions based on data, is it accurate? Is the analysis right? Are we actually working on a correct understanding of the data? Yeah. I I guess um, another lesson from this is to never throw away your data Right? Don't just yeah, throw away absolutely. your data and keep your deciphered version your of it, I suppose, your mm-hmm. decoded version of your data, because your decoding could be incorrect. And if you don't have the original, you can never go back to fix it. That's right. Yeah. But we don't always have that option. Um, if you look at the square kilometre array, mm-hmm. for example, the, the huge telescope system that we're building, yeah. that's getting 68.4 terabytes of data <laughs> per second. You can't store it. You, you, you just can't. <laughs> like, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, syn- the synchrotron, the Large Hadron Collider, there's so many, so many sources of data that we have now where we simply can't store it all. So you have to store the processed version. Yeah. You really want to be sure that processing's right. I suppose you need a better, like a, a zip encoder uh, <laughs> to shrink your data. <laughs> yeah. Lossless data compression. <laughs> compression, <laughs> the ultimate yeah. goal. That's part of data science, isn't it? And yeah, actually, yeah, with it that, uh, that reminds me of another question I want to ask. Can you give us some examples of where data science is really changing our everyday life? Not just, you know, when we have a brain tumor, uh, you no know, good, or when we are scanning the universe for signs of life or whatever else we are scanning it for, but you no, know, everyday life. Where, where's the data science? So data science is is in so much of what we do now. Uh, it's in the control of the traffic lights, hmm. you know, analyzing traffic patterns and, and traffic flow and trying to optimize the traffic light sequence to optimize traffic flow. That's data science. When you buy something on Amazon and it recommends other things you might like, that's data yeah. science. Uh, when Facebook suggests friends to you, <laughs> that's data science. It's... Under the hood, it's kind of in the background, it's changing a lot of things. For example, there's some concern at the moment about our medical records being digitized and kind of uh, held by the government in a central place, Mm, but there's immense potential for that also to be an incredibly positive thing. One study that was done a couple of years ago on Parkinson's disease discovered there were clusters of Parkinson's in particular areas oh. of rural oh. Victoria. Right. And when they anal- analysed that and looked at sort of what connected these two areas and things like that, they discovered that it was associated with a particular pesticide used on barley crops. Hmm. So you can identify disease causes and all kinds of different Things that, you know, for, in terms of social justice can actually make a massive difference. You know, if you identify which areas are not vaccinating, for example, you can work on particular strategies to encourage those areas to to vaccinate. Hmm. We can actually really improve our quality of lives dramatically. So it's quite interesting then. Pretty much every aspect of our life in modern society is affected one way or another by data science and the methods that are developed there and the capabilities that are developed. I'm thinking like cars. You you mentioned traffic. Uh, I believe there's a lot more work to be done there because I I feel like I'm constantly (laughs) stuck in traffic. But but I I imagine, say, um, not just traffic on the road, but um, air traffic. I was reading Mm -hmm. how, you know, the proliferation of traveling by air anywhere in the world how that traffic in the air has increased dramatically over the last 20 years would not be possible without data science and the ability of computers to control flight paths and 
separation of aircraft and all that. So that That's has right. changed the life of anyone who is going on a holiday <laughs> by plane or uh-huh. for work. Yeah. Uh, another example of impact on air travel is a study I heard about recently where they looked at controlling the aircraft's flight to maximize uh, fuel efficiency. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I can't remember the precise numbers, but it was something amazing like close to 10% difference they could make just by analyzing the different factors on the travel and optimizing things like altitude and speed and, you know, not changing the number of passengers or the amount of cargo or the routes or anything, but just optimizing things very slightly can save massive amounts of fuel on, on each trip. So it really has an impact on everything. Um, if you look at, for example, car safety studies, you know, crash mm-hmm. test dummies and all that kind of stuff, that's all data science now because they're, they're tracking what happens to every sensor in, on the crash test dummy and, uh, and making sure that, you know, th- they know exactly what happens to every part of the body. And yeah. something that I saw actually last week at a conference about that really shocked me because up until recently... Females in car accidents were 47% more likely to be seriously injured than males. And for a long time, people assumed that that was because uh, women were worse drivers. It turns out that the reason for this is simply that crash test dummies until uh, I think it was 2003 were only ever male bodies. (laughs) And when they actually started to, to, to put crash test dummies that were modeled after female bodies, that's when they started to design cars that, you know, so basically cars were optimized for male safety, not for female safety. Yeah. yeah. And now, yeah. they've only now started to consider that. Now, if you think about it, how many people on the roads are still driving cars that were not designed, you know, yeah. in the last five Absolutely. years, we, we still have a really long way to go. I suppose the same thing goes for, for children. If the, mm-hmm. Yeah, the data set then is very important. It's not just the method that you apply, but the data exactly. set that you are process through your methods. Right. I was also looking at, as you were talking, at some information about air travel and saving fuel and reducing CO2 emissions. And um, mm-hmm. a couple of articles that I brought up, isn't Google amazing, by the way? It's just data science <laughs> there as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, air flight and air traffic produces 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And just by using data science to better analyze routes, for example, schedules of planes and uh, you know, configurations of planes, uh, you can save a lot of that, about 10% per year, I think, which is uh, a few millions uh, worth of tons of CO2 plus fuel that you don't burn. And exactly. So I wanted to to ask you next, just to to shift into education a little bit. Data science is, in my um, as a layman now, I'm speaking as a as a lay person in data science. Uh, it does require a multitude of skills. So you already mentioned things such as uh, the mathematics. Obviously, you need to be very strong in mathematics, but I'm sure there's other skills. I'd like to ask you to give us some examples of the things the knowledge sets and skills that a data scientist would need. And then how transferable are those skills along data science and applying data science in different industries? So we mentioned commerce, for example, there's social networking, there's medicine, investing, Mm -hmm. obviously. So um, as uh, big firms, hedge funds and all that, use a lot of data to make the bets. So um, that's what I'd like to ask you, the kind of skills that a data scientist uh, would need and then how transferable are those skills across all those different things that you can do with data science? So first and foremost, I would argue that data scientists need to be critical thinkers. Mm. And data science, as as I teach it at least, is a, is a form of critical thinking using data. So it's asking critical questions of data that you're presented with, but it's also asking critical questions of your own data sets and trying to disprove your theories, Hmm. which is really the essence of science, is trying to disprove your hypothesis (laughs) rather than trying to prove it. Because if you set out to prove something, you will tend to ignore the evidence that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's human nature. 
and we have a thing called confirmation bias yeah. where we we just try to try to support our own conclusions. So it's incredibly important to be a really critical thinker and to to try to disprove your hypothesis and really test it very thoroughly. Uh, one example I heard um, Professor Jeff Webb from Monash Uni use was a, a great one. He'd been asked by a company to to find out what customers who bought lingerie also bought mm-hmm. you know, so they could try to maximise their profits. And he found that 95% of customers who bought lingerie also bought lollies. And, yeah. and they were really excited by this result. It was like, great, we can, you know, we can maximise this. <laughs> but when they looked into it further, they found that actually 95% of all customers buy lollies. So, so you could, he could have stopped at that first conclusion and gone, you know, right, I'm done. Yes. We, we know there's this correlation between customers buying lingerie and buying lollies. If you keep looking you can disprove often that that first theory. And in fact, I had that with the data set I was working with just recently. I was looking at a data set that shows solar installations by postcode around Australia. And there are there are some naive ways to, to kind of work with that data set. And the first thing I did was I just sorted it. I went, what are the top 20? And I looked and of the top 20, almost all of those postcodes were in Queensland or WA. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, wow, Queensland and WA are absolutely leading the way in solar installations. That's really interesting. I wonder why. And I started looking at, you know, regulations and subsidies and all that kind of stuff, and, and I couldn't really find a reason. And when I went back and looked at the data again, this time I averaged by state, and I found that actually Queensland and WA are not leading at all. It's just that the top postcodes happen to be in Queensland and WA. And that kind of thing often happens where you get a new uh, a suburb with a lot of building going on because new buildings yeah. have to have yeah. you know, have to meet the code and tend to have more solar. So I was completely misled by that that top 20 thing into thinking that they were the top states. But in fact, yeah. when you look at the whole data set, turns out they're not. And I felt really bad about that. And I'm like, oh man, that was that was a that was a you know data science 101 fail. <laughs> But I, then I went and looked at the reporting around that data set because it had just come out. And all the reporting was, oh, look, the top 10 were all in WA in Queensland. Or were the reports on newspapers? So, I, yeah, so I wasn't alone. <laughs> People were all, it, it's very easy to, to look at that yeah. first naive solution and go, right, I understand this data set now. Yeah, sensationalized. Right, so you have to be critical. You have to be really sceptical and you have to really um, drill down and, and look at your data in as many ways as you have at your disposal to make sure that you understand it. And those skills, they're phenomenally useful anywhere. Hmm. Oh, you know, no, and and yeah. data science, everyone's employing data scientists now from hospitals, universities, banks, yeah. retail companies, everybody needs data scientists. And they're all basically the same skills. It's just give me a data set and let me understand it and let me communicate it. Um, just a quick parenthesis for anybody interested in critical thinking and confirmation bias and things of that sort. You can listen to episode 33 where we talked to Tim Mentham uh, on the power of critical thinking. Uh, it was actually a very interesting conversation and a lot of what you're saying, Linda, is just reminding me of that interview. It's quite interesting. I'll have to go yeah. back and listen. Yeah. Uh, so I also wanted just to continue on the same uh, track that we've said about other skills, like uh, concrete skills such as mathematics, programming, uh, computer science as well. I know a lot of people don't know the difference between computer science and data science. If you could explain mm-hmm. what the difference is. Oh, uh, well, I think that would be a whole other podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not, it, there's no simple answer. <laughs> yeah, right, go, timing. Um, the difference between computer science and data science. Um, computer science is a broader set of skills. I would argue that data science is a subset of computer science. Mm-hmm. Computer science is, is all about not just programming, but the algorithms and efficiency and and finding optimal solutions to mm. things. Data science is that, but with a, a data focus. So can I can I jump in there and just uh, give a yeah. little example? And you can tell me if my example is correct or not. So I'm thinking that a computer scientist would be interested in figuring out an algorithm that could sort a bunch of numbers really, really quickly and use minimal memory in the computer. And a data scientist would be interested in taking that algorithm and applying it in data that is coming from a medical scanner, for example. Would that be kind of a a correct analogy? That's a pretty good analogy. Um, 
but of course these are not distinct hmm. you know skills that you can put in two separate yeah. boxes there's a huge amount of overlap like everything pretty much in science right everything is just yeah that's right mixed up <laughs> and you know that's where the interesting stuff is right on the on the borders between different areas and and where you can use one area to inform another but i should actually clarify at the start you introduced me as a data scientist mm -hmm. and i'm not a data scientist <laughs> okay. um i'm a data science educator which is a slightly uh, fraught yes. position for someone who's not a data <laughs> scientist but so you know a real data scientist is using complex machine learning and statistical techniques and and stuff that i really don't know a lot about yeah yeah if you you're a real data scientist you know a whole lot of stuff that i haven't even scratched the surface mm. of mm, but i'm looking at introductory <laughs> data science at you know really teaching people those fundamental skills to know whether data science is even something they're interested in yeah and you know just to start on that journey i would hesitate i, I wouldn't call myself a data scientist yeah you're an educator first start. right yeah. <laughs> that's right can i oh with this is actually a very good introduction to the next thing i want to ask you about and that is about you being a superstar of stem and congratulations by the way i think that's an awesome title yeah, can you tell us what <laughs> that really means to you and practically as as a superstar of stem what do you do so the role of the superstars of stem program is really to provide role models for particularly for girls to show that there's a, a huge diversity of possible careers in stem and also to show that that women can can rock those careers just as much as men can. Mm -hmm. So we've been trained in media techniques and and telling our stories and in engaging with people and trying to show them the power of STEM and the kinds of work that we do. And um, we we talk to schools. The whole idea is really to connect with people and to make STEM a more approachable and relatable field. For me personally, the training has been invaluable, but the biggest outcome of it for me has been the the connection with the other superstars of STEM and the support of that network has been just phenomenal yeah. and I don't think that I would have had the courage to to leave teaching and to start up a, a registered charity and try to <laughs> change the world if I didn't have that support network behind me it's been phenomenal. Yeah so are you also involved with you know helping girls in particular but I, I guess kids in general, really young people, into potentially considering a career in data science or science in general? Is that something that you also do? Yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing, because although my focus is on training teachers in this stuff so that they can put it into their curriculum, because I can train 30 teachers and thus reach hmm. a lot more classes than I can if I'm just teaching classes. But If kids never experience this stuff and never see the power of it, then they never actually consider it as something they might want to do. And for me, you know, a lot of tech education these days is the school gets in someone to run a robot program for a day and they say, tick, we just did STEM or, or we just mm. did tech and, and now it's done. And that might be fun, but the kids aren't learning how relevant this is and how important this is. Yeah. So my focus has always been on using real data sets so that the kids have the opportunity to make discoveries, to find things out that people perhaps didn't already know, to make scientific discoveries, to contribute to scientific research. All of that is within the power of everybody from, you know, really from, from kindergarten upwards. I'm working at the moment with one school who... Uh, they're based in an area where there's a lot of development going on. There's a lot of community opposition to the development. Mm. So we thought we'd work that into the curriculum and say, okay, well, let's actually measure the traffic flow in two streets that are fairly similar, but have, you know, one has a higher density development in it and the other one doesn't. Let's actually get the kids to do traffic counts and, and pedestrian counts and, and look at the use of the neighborhood. And that is data science, right? It's right. collecting the data and then, analyzing the data and seeing what impact that is having on your own environment, yeah. solving problems in your own community. So I guess that's what you call an authentic project experience, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and for me, that is the incredible power of data science. You don't need to buy expensive robotics kits that will be broken in a year or obsolete. <laughs> you yeah. don't need... You don't, you also, you know, you said before, you need amazing skills to be a data scientist. Yeah. And to, of course, to be a professional data scientist, you do. But to do data science in the classroom, all you need is a spreadsheet and a source of data. Mm. And there are sources of data all around us. Yeah. 
absolutely. Um, and the, like the impact, uh, actually, I should say, the return on investment, it could be enormous, like all the things that we talked exactly. about earlier, including probably the one on top of the ability to think critically and then use tools that you learn in data science to make decisions, perhaps, you know, um, yeah. find out what's true. It could be um, something that a politician said, something that a journalist said, whether it's likely to be true or not. I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> but, <laughs> we could just, be here all day if we start I, that game. <laughs> yeah, I had another question earlier. I'm not going to ask it now because uh, there's a couple of others I want to put in, but uh, I was thinking of uh, you know, well-known politicians and world leaders who shall not be named, who hang on on the idea that gut feeling or living your life, depending on some kind of intuition, is, is superior to using logic right. and data analysis. And uh, yeah. I, I think you already answered the question. <laughs> well, we all do that a lot. Mm. You know, it is mm. the way the human brain is kind of <laughs> yeah. is is optimized to work in some sense. Yeah. So we actually we need to challenge our own assumptions as well as everybody else's. Uh, it's all about discipline, isn't it? And it comes back to education as well to be able to mm-hmm. question yourself and whether you are right, not to um, automatically support your gut feeling, but to recognize that it is just a gut feeling and test whether the data supports it. But it takes discipline to exactly. do that. Exactly. One of the things that, like one of the examples I use in my talks is of a study some years ago that was conducted on the Israeli parole board. Mm -hmm. And they were looking at factors that led to prisoners getting parole. And they were looking, you know, was it the type of crime? Was it the the gender of the prisoner? How reformed they were? What their behaviour was like? And they found that one of the key factors in whether the prisoners got parole or not was actually how recently the judge had last eaten. (laughs) <laughs> and this was this was is across a, a range of different judges. It is absolutely true. Oh. You can look it up. I can send you the reference. Uh, it's a classic psych study, really, because those judges would not have told you that the reason they didn't give that guy parole was because they were hangry. <laughs> they had reasons, you know, yes. and they had very valid reasons for it, and they had thought it through. We don't know. We don't really understand our own decision-making process, and a lot of the time we're not aware of the, the influences on the way we think. So being able to to surface those and question them is really important. Uh, now I've got to ask you, and we are running out of time, but I think it's an important question. Did that study also look into the kind of food that the judges were eating, like it was high in <laughs> carbohydrates? In Not that I know bread. of, no. That's the next thing, I think. <laughs> you got to know it what is. they it's ate. It's an important <laughs> follow-up study. <laughs> um, I also want to ask you about the Data Science for High Schools workshop that you run as uh, you know, one of the things that the Institute does. Could you tell mm-hmm. us about what the workshop is about, how it works? Well, there's a range of workshops depending on which kind of teachers I'm working with. Mm-hmm. So um, we will choose different data sets and things, but the basic skills are the same. It's how do you find authentic data sets to work with? How do you coach the students in what kinds of questions that the data set can and can't answer? Um, for example, one of the first data sets I worked with uh, with my year 10s was voting data from the Australian federal election. Mm. We had the Senate votes for Victoria. So we had a, a file which had every single vote cast for the Senate in Victoria. It was over 3 million lines of data. And the first thing the students wanted to know from that data set was, what's the best party? <laughs> and unfortunately, that data the does not party. contain the answer to that. <laughs> what it tells you is who got the most votes, yes. right? So you can ask quantitative questions, but qualitative questions, not so much. So it's, you know, it's about what kinds of questions does the data answer? And then once you've got the the question, how do you analyze it to get the answer to that? And then how do you visualize it? And depending on the teachers that I'm working with, we might use programming to do that. And if you're using a programming language like Python, that gives you an immense power and flexibility to Mm -hmm. do some really complex analysis of the data. But you can also do it just in a spreadsheet. You can take a smaller data set and do a whole lot of analysis in spreadsheet without any programming skills, just, yeah. you know, graphing and doing basic um, statistics for which, you know, the spreadsheet has the functions built in, looking for correlations and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it depends what I'm working with. Right. So essentially the, these workshops prepare teachers to be data scientists, educators. Yeah, yeah. but in the context of their own subject. Yeah. So, for example, in environmental science class might look at particulates um, Mm. in air quality data, which is one of the data sets I've been working with from CSIRO. 
uh, is some Sydney air quality data. Um, whereas a geography unit might look at um, land use or farming practices. Like water sources and rivers and Yeah, like exactly. Um, or, you know, uh, even climate data and ice cover and the yeah. polar regions, things like that. Whereas maths might just be looking at the graphing aspect of things um, or at the stats, depending on what unit we're working with. The idea, the goal with the workshops is the teachers come away with a data set that fits their needs, worked up into a set of exercises or assignments or, you know, mm-hmm. classroom mm-hmm. Um, lesson plans that, that they can then take back and use in context. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think this is a great initiative and uh, yeah, I'm really um, pleased that it exists. I think if I was a teacher, I would definitely take your program. And I'm actually, <laughs> actually, yes, tell us about uh, how do you deliver? Is it like an online program or do you go into uh, a classroom with teachers to deliver it? How does it work? Like if, if I'd like to take your so program. So I have been running some workshops as part of conferences. So you can mm-hmm. sign up to go to a a workshop externally to your school mm-hmm. or I also work with schools or go in and, and run a workshop um, for all teachers or for a particular faculty or do some one-on-one work. Right. It's up to the school. And I'm also building a collection of resources on the website so that people can go and just look at the resources and mm-hmm. if they're happy to download and run them, run with them, then they can. You know, they're, they're freely available. The other thing that I'm doing that I think is incredibly important is I'm building a network of teachers who are interested in doing this kind of thing so that they can support each other um, because there's no way that a single institute can support yeah. every school around Australia, you know, 24-7. That's a lot of data. And it's really important. <laughs> we know that when teachers get a new thing to do, when it goes pear-shaped, because, you know, new things always go pear-shaped, at some point you have to have somebody there to turn to and go, ag, when I tried to do this, it, it, this happened. And then there are other people who can go, oh, yeah, I did that and right. I got around it this way. They need support at that point. So building that network of teachers who are doing this kind of thing is really important. Um if people would like to uh, find out, for example, when the next workshop might be happening or information about how they can contribute, do they just go to your website and you've got a contact us yeah. form there? Yes, go to the website. Um, sign up for the mailing list is the best thing mm-hmm. because it only comes out once a month or so, but that'll contain information about upcoming workshops and um, ways you can work with us, volunteer with us, and sponsor us, all that kind of stuff. I've just signed up, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, oh, great. I'd like to move into rapid fire questions now and ask you, what's your favorite programming language? Python. Without yeah, a Python doubt. Person. Python. Yeah, I'd guess so. Yeah. And I, I can hear the screaming out there in the ether. No, <laughs> It's a very religious question. Uh, not from you, but from the people <laughs> listening. But the reason I like Python is because it's a very easy language to learn. It's yeah. um, it's got a nice readable syntax, but it's also a real world language which has mm. extraordinary power for especially doing you know text processing and and data processing. Yeah. It's it's brilliant. It's no accident that Google was built on Python, like the <laughs> first um, uh, spider algorithm from Google was implemented in Python. Um, I did not know that. That is yeah, cool. But I think uh, Python, one of its advantages, other than the, the syntax as well, is that it it has libraries that are perfect for data mining, for things like data mining and other, you know, algorithms that are very useful in data sciences. So that, that means, right. if I understand right, it means that you don't really need to write that much Python code once you learn how to use yeah. uh, the existing software that other people have written to do data That's science right. work. So not many other languages have doesn't this. matter what you want to do, there's a module out there to yeah, do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, what about books? I'm very interested to know what people like you read. And um, uh, what are your favorite books in, in both data science and education? So my, my two most fascinating books at the moment would be Weapons of Math Destruction Sounds by Cathy O'Neill, which is, <laughs> it's a really good one about... It's really about fairness and inequality in big in the use of big data. Yeah, um, it, it's a fascinating read. Um, and the other one, uh, which I just re- finished reading recently, is Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, and it's a fabulous study about the way we make decisions and the things that influence us that we don't that we're not even aware of. <laughs> you know, just the way the brain works, that we are quite irrational in our decision making process, but 
but that if we know the ways in which we're irrational, yeah, <laughs> we can yeah. you know we can we can work around that. Another one in the same vein is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. <laughs> I really like those titles. Like like half the book is a title. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. They're Thank cleverly you. Cleverly worded. Yeah, that's really good. Speaking of books, um, have you read The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People? No. So it's one of the books that I've read, I've read and I am fascinated by the things that people do to you know, augment uh, their effectiveness, I suppose, the productivity, things like that. Do you have any habits that you believe are contributing to you being highly, a highly productive and effective person in your life? Um, I think that that thing that you picked up on initially is probably the, the single most important thing, which mm-hmm. is the the professional outlier. Mm-hmm. Being different, seeing things differently. When I first set up the, the Australian Data Science Education Institute, I spent the first couple of months looking around going, this is such an obvious idea. Somebody must already be doing it. Yeah. And to my astonishment, I could not find anybody doing this really anywhere in the world there are you know teachers doing stuff but there's there's not this kind of overall approach and I I said to my friend it's so obvious I can't understand why everyone isn't doing it she said it's only obvious to you and I think that's a that's a a position from which you can make change where you can see things that other people don't see yeah yeah Hmm. It's so interesting as well. Like we are working with children, and I find it very common, like that children feel awkward if they perceive themselves as not fitting with the rest of the classroom. So you don't want to be the odd one out in a classroom, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's how I felt as well when I was a kid. And in, oh, me too. in reality, we should really be very careful to explain to children that it's okay to be different. And uh, actually, it is, uh, it's a good thing to be different. You get to uh, 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 be comfortable <laughs> with your difference <laughs> because it's going to take you places. <laughs> I could not agree more. I think we need to encourage our kids not to fit in, oh, that's to, to be different, to do things differently and to challenge the status quo. I, just, yeah. I think that's, that's, how, that's how change happens. That's how progress happens. Well, um, I guess my second last question is, what advice would you give to a new teacher just coming out of teaching school? Uh, don't believe that it has to be done that way just because it always has. <laughs> be different. I think that was, seriously, that was my biggest advantage in coming to teaching was that I came to teaching late and I came to it from something else. Mm. And therefore, I was not hampered by 20 years of having done things the way they'd always been yeah, done. Yeah. And I had the the confidence to go, we can do this differently. And I have the advantage of teaching in the in the computer science space where there isn't a lot of history, at least in in high school sense. So, you know, I was able to to create things from scratch. But you can do things, you can do new things and you can try new things. And that's the only way that that education will advance. Yeah. So don't be afraid to try new things and don't believe that it has to be done the way everyone else does it. Yep. Education is not copy-paste. No. you got to be uh, flexible. <laughs> <laughs> Evolve <That's right. laughs> with, with um, the world around you. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, last question, seriously now. Um, <laughs> here's my last question. How can people get in touch with you? Do you have, um, obviously, you've got an email address. Uh, is it your preferred method yep. or do you have social media where you can get uh, your data aggregated by Facebook, perhaps? <laughs> so <others? laughs> I am very active on Twitter. You can find Twitter. me there. Yep. You can, as I said, sign up on the website, sure. um, sign up for the mailing list. Just any way you can find me, find me. I'm, I'm out there. I'm pretty easy to find. You don't have a problem with your data being out there, right? <laughs> I am way, way more open than most people think mm. is wise yeah. online, and I'm fine with that. But it does worry me sometimes, not that people will find stuff out about me, but the way that the way that companies can use my information mm. against me. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that's what Cambridge Analytica was Cambridge doing. Analytics, it, was, it, was, yeah. it was using people's data to manipulate their voting habits and and i i think that's terrifying that's, yeah absolutely. not so much not so much on a personal level but on a societal level the implications of that yeah just uh, like they used to say knowledge phenomenal. is gold or i'd say data yeah. is gold <laughs> and, 
Yeah. Um, you can definitely shift um, like governance and election results mm-hmm. and uh, you know, the marketplace itself based on the data that you can either yep. acquire somehow or steal. <laughs> yep. That's a whole other podcast, though. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time, Linda. Really appreciate your time. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing or uh, to receiving your newsletter, first of all. And uh, who knows, one day uh, I might come down to Melbourne and take one of your workshops and learn Excellent. about data science. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. It's been fun. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. That's all for this episode. The notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Linda are available on our website, techexplorations.com forward slash p forward slash stemiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a gold mine of information in the notes. This Stemiverse podcast episode was produced by Tech Explorations. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Would you like to nominate a friend or colleague to be our guest? Please email us at pa at txplore.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, STEMiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time.